Once again, folks, I may not be able to address this again. I fear that this video will be taken down. So please download it. Get a copy before it's removed. Spread it. Hey everybody, it's Jason Blaha here, and I want to have a little story time for you guys. And remember guys, this is story time. This is just stories. So because it's just stories, this is not anything that uh, anyone could use in court. And I'm not going to say anything in this video that could really get me into a lot of trouble. So I'm going to be very careful with what I say. And you know what, guys? It doesn't matter if you believe me. It doesn't actually matter. The only reason I came forward with any of this, people might have noticed the timing. A rumor came down to me after all this lawsuit stuff happened when I was abroad in the United Kingdom that something had been uncovered, that a lawyer involved in this had uncovered something. <clears throat> and I wanted to be proactive. And I figured, well, since this is about to come out, this could float out into the, <clears throat> this could float out into the community. There's already been certain hints and jokes about it here and there. Uh, that I caught that I realized I should probably just admit to it because yeah a lot of people wouldn't believe it and that was okay because when this does if it does come out at least I can claim I didn't hide it and it softened the blow and instead what's ended up happening is of course all these people have just said hey you're a liar large numbers of people have said you're a liar but you know what here's the thing this is still floating around out there in my past and if it ever does fully come to light or it comes to light at least I will be able to say that I didn't hide it I admitted to it and all the people who are like well we'll leave you alone if you just admit the truth well here's the problem with that sure if I turn that around and I claim I just made that up and I was lying what's gonna happen is sure some of those people will quit some will continue some people will forgive me and they'll say, hey, you have great information, Jason, so it's okay. And then if the truth surfaces and this really does come out later, if enough people keep digging into my life as I become a bigger public figure, it's going to end up being a case of, well, so you admitted it and then took it back because you're a coward. Then it turns out to be true. So you're both a murderer and a liar and a coward. From my perspective, I would rather be a murderer or a liar than to be considered both and a coward all at the same time. That's just what I would rather have happen. So that's why I have to stand my ground on this one and stand by my guns. And I need to address this because I have so many ridiculous people, some of them veterans now contacting me, contacting my girlfriend about the whole false valor thing because of all the things going around on the internet and people don't understand what they're actually talking about with any of this. My detractors don't understand. A lot of these younger veterans do not actually understand. And it's because there's some major confusions going on there because maybe people don't clearly understand the words that I used. And they don't understand the world has fundamentally changed in the United States. It's a different world in the post 9-11 world from what it was when I was a young man. And we'll come to that in a second. But first of all, let me give you guys the actual definition of a mercenary so that some of these veterans can quit being upset accusing me of stolen valor, of what a mercenary is. According to the Wikipedia page, a mercenary is a person who takes part in armed conflict who is not a national or a party to the conflict and is motivated to take part in the hostilities by the desire for private gain. In other words, a mercenary is a person who fights for personal gain or money or other recompense instead of fighting for the ideological interest of a country, whether they be for or against the existing government. And it goes on, however, whether a person or not is a mercenary may be a matter of degree as financial and national interest may overlap. Does anything about that sound like valor or honor in that definition of that word? And so maybe even then, since that word is too extreme for them, I grew up a hunter. I grew up a competitive shooter and a hunter. I hunted since I was six years old. I shot since I was six years old. I started doing long distance rifle shooting in competition when I was 12 years old. So 
we'll call it a hunter. I was a hunter of exotic game, if that will make you guys feel better. And a pretty good chunk of the game that I hunted was a very dangerous type of game that did some sort of masonry or brick laying because they stacked bricks of some type up. All right, so let's go back and look at timelines a little bit. A lot of you guys grew up in a completely different world politically and even from a, a war perspective. You guys, a lot of you guys reached adulthood around the time of 9-11 or shortly thereafter or in that range. I'm turning 40 years old this year. I was 18 at the end of 1994. I turned 18 in 1994. President Clinton became president in 93. So my young adulthood was during the Clinton years, during the Clinton administration. So President Clinton was the president from the time I was 17 all the way until I was 25. The president before him was George Bush Sr., who was the former head of the CIA, which we then allowed to be vice president twice. He, he pretty much ran the show on Reagan. And then he became president, and he had his own ideas about the way the world should be run and the way the country should be run and what our national interests were behind the scenes. But the Clinton administration was one of the most corrupt administrations there ever was. And people who don't know that just need to look a little bit at all the things that have gone on with the Clintons over the years. Look at how many hundreds and hundreds of people who had associations with them from their various administrations, business partners, things like that, either died in accidents or committed suicide. That list is getting really, really long. So yes, I became a man at the start of the Clinton presidency. I was scouted out for certain types of work before I even finished high school. Again, due to my family, my upbringing, connections certain members of my families might have had along with my shooting skills. Again, I was shooting very successfully at a thousand yards as a teenager, well before I was an adult, in actual competitions. So it isn't far-fetched that I may have been offered certain types of employment at that point. And people keep saying things like, and particularly, again, like my ex-wife said all this, who, again, I don't know why anyone would think that my ex-wife has any sort of expertise on either the military or mercenaries when she did a paid interview. But people keep saying only mercenaries, only people who become mercenaries are people who were in the military, who were combat veterans. Look at what was going on in the mid and late 90s in the United States, nearby countries, and all around the world. What military veterans? What military veterans did we have in the 90s who would be willing to do large amounts of morally questionable work? The only veterans we had were from Vietnam, and those guys were getting really old at that point. And we had a very, very short engagement, a very, very short war in Iraq and Desert Storm that had a very limited number of troops, many of whom still hold on to ideas uh, like honor and valor, with very little combat experience. There were no veterans, logistically speaking. Where were people going to get veterans to do the massive amount of exotic game hunting and similar work that was being done? Look what was going on in this country during the Clinton years. We were in the middle of the drug wars, or some people like to call them the powder wars. There was massive fighting all through Mexico, Central America, dealing with drug cartels, uh, everyone from the DEA trying to crack down on them, to government agencies being caught distributing their drugs back into the inner cities. There have been so many cases where uh, government agents were actually linked to distribution of crack and cocaine in enormously large quantities. So you had so many factions involved with all of this inside the government itself, outside the government. The gang wars had spilled into the streets. We had an enormous amount of death and violence in this country due to the gang wars and the drugs and the drug cartels and everything going on that people who are living in this era don't understand because they didn't see what was going on. A lot of this stuff reflected in all these gangster movies. That's what reflects what was going on in this country during that time period inside of our cities. There was a drug war happening in the streets. There was a drug war happening all the way from our border with Mexico all the way down into Venezuela and Colombia. 
there was an enormous amount of mercenaries being hired to do various work. And there weren't enough veterans, not even close to enough veterans, to do all of those jobs. So that idea is just absurd. This is people who can't even do logistics or look what was going on at the world at that time, who think that because now we have veterans everywhere. We just had two protracted wars. We recruited millions of new soldiers for those wars, trained them, and we have all these veterans. We didn't have young, skilled veterans during that day. They just weren't there. They didn't exist in any sort of meaningful number. So yes, people with any of the right backgrounds who could be trained, who had aptitudes, were recruited to do this sort of work, who had no military experience. Large numbers of them were. I met large numbers of men with no military experience, young men who just had certain aptitudes and skill sets or the right connections that got trained up to do this sort of work. And it wasn't full-time jobs. These were often on things a weekend here, a week there, a couple weeks here, a couple weeks there, in and out of the country. And men weren't even always paid cash because the truth was this was a very competitive market, a competitive environment. It was very dangerous. And there were other things worth more than money for people who wanted to stay in this line of work. Training and hardware. Those things were worth their weight in gold. There were times because of the lack of getting enough training and needing access to newer tactics, newer skills, things that were being learned and pushed out there, that a lot of guys would do jobs and work for free and it be paid by having access to certain training facilities from time to time meaning they would go do a job and maybe be allowed and be trained at a certain facility for two weeks. Or they would be given access to hardware that they couldn't easily buy themselves. They couldn't just go buy it in normal gun shops and equipment and things and armor and weaponry. And equipment that was very difficult to get that they would sometimes do jobs in exchange for hardware to improve their operational capacity, to improve their ability to make money, and when it comes to military-grade hardware and access to training facilities, nobody has deeper pockets than Uncle Sam. And during the Clinton years, they had very deep pockets when it came to that sort of thing. And the beautiful part, all of these young men were completely disposable. Completely disposable assets at the end of the day. We got worked. We got worked hard and sometimes we got broken. And since none of these men were members of the military, none of us were members of government agencies. We had no VA benefits. We had no access to resources when things went wrong because everything was done clandestinely. La Tibre Factum. And yeah, a lot of these men broke I watched a lot of guys that I knew, a lot of guys that I had become friends with, either die in the field, kill themselves either at their own hand or supposed suicides, or just be disposed of and disappear. Because at the end of the day, we were all disposable and when we became a liability, we could just be thrown away like garbage. And so all these veterans today who have now come back from these other wars and thought they were going to get all these VA benefits that they were promised and all this therapy and medical help guys die while waiting in line in the VA at least 20 veterans are committing suicide every day from these last two engagements in spite of the government promising them all of this therapy and PTSD uh, treatment you already know how our government at the end of the day uses up its assets and throws them away but I'm one of the lucky ones and I survived so those of you who don't believe any of this, that's okay. I really don't give a fuck. I'm still telling my story. This is, this is what it is. And if you don't believe me, fuck you. Go fuck yourself. I don't care. For all these guys who are veterans who are standing there still screaming about your valor, stolen valor after what I just told you, that that sounds like I'm stealing any of your valor, you know what? Fuck you, kid. You can go fuck yourself. I don't really care what you think. But I will tell you this. If you decide that you're going to come confront me physically about it, 
you better not be a fucking pog. You better be a stone cold killer. If you come at me aggressively, voice raised, negative body language as someone who I know is a trained killer. Because I don't flinch anymore when I hear a rifle round come by my head. When I hear that whoop and that snap of that sonic boom, I haven't flinched in 20 years from that shit. I got over that a long time ago. So if you come at me, I want you to know, son, it's not going to be me who goes in the ground. I'm still here. I'm still upright and drawing air. All right, guys, so there's my story. There's my explanation. I'm done.